So thank you everyone for joining. I'm uh, Mike Frost. I'm a senior advisor here at the University of Oslo, responsible for product management around Tracker. Um, and very excited to talk to you today and actually listen more from uh, some of the country examples about how they have set up their architecture around supporting the COVID-19 response and vaccine delivery. I'm just going to do a, a fairly brief intro to give you uh, some insight into how we, from the platform perspective, approach uh, the, the idea of architecture, interoperability, integration. Um, the first thing to mention, of course, is that COVID-19, as you've heard throughout the conference, has been, of course, a, a massive effort over the last year and a half. Uh, it's put a lot of strain on uh, health systems and on health information systems. And we had many countries quickly adopt some of the COVID-19 packages that we published around contact tracing, test reporting, port of entry, and now, of course, the vaccine packages. And so we've also learned a lot during this time about what kinds of systems need to be linked together to support uh, these efforts and have also learned some, some kind of new and innovative ways to connect such uh, systems together. So we'll, we'll hear a bit from three different approaches. Uh, Marcus, who is the technical lead for Tracker, will talk to us a bit about Norway, uh, which has used DHS2 for the first time ever in their health system uh, over this last year and a half. Uh, then we'll hear from uh, Rajabu from uh, his Tanzania, who will talk to us about the efforts they've done there. And then Maurice from Rwanda. Um, what, what I wanted to do first is share just a little bit of one of the kind of legal definitions around this concept of architecture. Um, at the global level, when we're speaking with uh, many of the digital health global groups, there's often an emphasis on what is called enterprise architecture. And this term is, you know, it's, it's of some value to think about in terms of uh, what does that mean for any given country. The, the reason I've highlighted the definition here is because what I think is really important is that we're talking about more than the technology. So connecting two systems on a technical level is one thing, but there's much more that goes into this concept of what your architecture should look like for health information systems. We are you know, particularly interested in identifying what are the processes you're trying to support? What are the decisions that you want to make with your data? Where do those data live? Who are the people that enter them? Who are the people that should analyze them? And, and I would say out of this definition that you're seeing on the screen, Many countries, I think right now, are focused on kind of points uh, two and three in terms of they, they know what information they want and they focus on the technology. But maybe there's, there's less emphasis that's placed on what is kind of the strategic side of this. What are the transitional processes that need to be in place? And is there some larger overarching plan that the country is working towards in terms of having some comprehensive architecture? And, and I think that's fine because I also know from the literature that you know enterprise architecture as a concept really only succeeds about 10% 10, 10 of the time. Um, it's, there's a lot that must go into this in terms of planning and thinking, but these principles behind it and, and the ways of thinking about you know, what systems are you trying to link and why, I think are incredibly valuable. And I think that does lead to more successful integrations. And we'll, we'll hear from some of those from, from our country examples today. We, we here at the university have recently launched a, a dedicated web page towards our approach for architecture and interoperability integration. I put the link here in the slides, which are available on Sketch for you to download if you haven't gone there previously. But for us, we, we really have some key principles that we try to focus on when we're being asked to do interoperability and linking between systems. We think it's, it's very important, again, not to be focused on the technology, but look at the goals that you're trying to achieve what would be the value to the users in terms of this data that you're trying to combine together. Think about the costs and benefits. Um, it can be incredibly costly and, and not ultimately result in something positive when you're doing an integration. And the idea is that rather than focusing on the software, focus on how the data will be used. Um, key to, I think, all of this, and in fact, key to the reason why many countries use DHS2 is that it can be done locally. So trying again to have uh, an approach to collecting health information and, and linking health information systems together, one that can be supported and replicated and last in the country where it is being, uh, being used. 
to to this effort, we the the University of Oslo try to engage in global collaboration and promote these principles and and try to develop tools to support you all with them. Of course, through things like this, our conference, but also in some of the international and global communities, uh, Open HIE, which some of you may be involved with, and also IHE International. Um, and we, we try to, again, be an advocate for what we see as working in the countries that we are supporting and that are using DHS2 um, and always are trying to learn more from these, uh, these different ways of setting up your DHS2 infrastructure and linking it to others. I just wanted to highlight again some of the tools that we have focused on up to now to try to make these, uh, these efforts possible. Um, these are uh, again laid out in more detail through the website. There's of course a lot of software documentation behind them, but, but we see first and foremost, we have always put emphasis on having a very open and robust API. Uh, we want you to be able to, to set out using the API tools, the kinds of queries and pulling of data that you'd like. We work within the standards community, so we have uh, supported and, and helped to get uh, adopted the ADX data format for aggregate data exchange. We're building, as you can see in the bottom, a Python integration toolkit where you're going to see more and more tools supporting some of the other standards like HL7 Fire or, or those related to ICD-10, ICD-11. Um, we also always have tried to promote a flexible data model um, that allows you to enter in the codes for other systems like uh, SNOMED, Medra, et cetera. All of these things we know are difficult and integration and interoperability are very difficult, but we're, we're constantly trying to find the best ways to support you and your countries and where they are. So I won't spend too much time on this. There are more interoperability sessions that you'll see throughout the conference. Tomorrow, we also have a plenary session where we'll discuss a bit more DHS2 within kind of the framework of uh, structure or ecosystem within the country. Um, and I just wanted to put this out there as an introduction as you're looking at the different tools that these uh, country implementations have used to create a, a robust COVID-19 system that also speaks to other systems in the country and makes use of those, uh, those connections. So with that, I think I will turn it over to Marcus as our first speaker talking to us about the Norwegian implementation. Thanks, Mike. Um, let me uh, share my screen here. There, I think you can see my presentation. Uh, yeah, so I'm Marcus Beckham. I'm uh, Marcus. Right now, I think we see everything except your presentation. <laughs> we see your Slack screen. We see a uh, sketch. Right. Uh, we're about now. Yes, much better. All right, thanks. Yeah, so I'm Marcus Beckham. I'm the tracker team lead at the UIO. Um, and um, in the last, um, uh, yeah, a little bit over a year, we have been involved uh, um, from the un university in the Norwegian COVID, um, COVID response. Um, I um, managed to invite a friend. Um, Helge is uh, also on the chat here, so maybe Simona, if you could uh, make him a co-host so he can unmute and correct me if there is anything um, or anything he wants to comment. Sure, what's his name? His, his name is Helge. So he's, um, he's working with the um, the, uh, one of the main partners that's doing uh, COVID surveillance in Norway. Okay. Um, in uh, in Norway, this uh, this contact tracers is not a very common sight, and um, and when we got COVID, um, there was a responsibility that um, had to be taken very seriously and that we had very little um, very little um, knowledge about in Norway and very little um, uh, traditional history for uh, for contact tracing. Uh, contact tracing would be uh, something that you would do in very desperate uh, situations uh, where you would have a, 
very rare condition that um, you needed to trace, for example, an HIV infection and a non-HIV infection. Um, and uh, sometimes there would be a TB case, but uh, those are so rare here in Norway that uh, it's almost um, almost something that you never do. And suddenly, all the 360 uh, municipalities in Norway had to make teams for contact tracing, and uh, everyone was running. Um, uh, in, in Norway, every municipality has an enormous amount of self-governance, um, and um, there isn't such a thing as a national solution for uh, almost anything. Um, the uh, municipalities will make their own or buy their own solutions from, um, from uh, third parties or, or build their own. In, in Norway, we ended up with three main separate solutions for uh, COVID response, um, for contact tracing, I mean. Oslo in the capital, they built their own. Um, they had a custom system that was um, that was uh, entirely um, uh, built for this um, this purpose. Um, there is another system that is called Remin. They are um, they are they started with the DHS2 core, um, but they did a lot of customizations on top and wrapped APIs and built a custom UI. Um, but they started with um, DHS and they were using cores of DHS. Um, at least uh, they have been using uh, DHS. Um, and then uh, the solution I'm going to focus most on and the solution that uh, Helge in the chat is um, uh, most uh, well works for is uh, CoS Fix. Um, and this is a standard DHS2 uh, running with a tracker capture app fork. But otherwise, it's uh, it's uh, there's no customizations um, apart from configuration. Um, so for the rest of this presentation, I'm going to talk about the other contact tracing solutions, uh, which will then uh, cover Oslo and the other Remin solution that we don't have so close ties to. And I will be speaking about this from the uh, perspective of the COS fix uh, instance. Um, so. Um, in, in this instance, the architecture from the beginning has been evolving very much. And it started up uh, as a, uh, an initiative from just um, uh, two of the municipalities, two uh, uh, of the Norwegian municipalities reached out directly to the UIO and started working with the uh, metadata package for COVID. Um, that had been just um, just uh, made um, and uh, translated into Norwegian. Um, then uh, COS Fix picked, picked up this um, uh, this uh, work and uh, and hosted a minimum viable product for index and contact tracing. Um, so they, they started out with the very bare minimum and have been expanding into other use cases and other um, and, and some expansions to better support the existing use cases for the contact tracing. Um, so uh, in the Norwegian COVID response, I'm going to go through the architecture uh, here now and, and talk about the different solutions as we as they were built on. And it was really, it really started out with uh, just a very simple bare minimum and we built on uh, or COS built on um, more and more on this uh, on this framework. So we start with our contact tracer here, and um, there was uh, two tracker programs that was created for index and contact tracing. Uh, this was uh, two standard tracker programs, and there were relations between the indexes and contacts. There was dashboards and indicators and everything that you would know uh, from, um, from a standard DHS contact tracing scenario. Um, and uh, what COAS did was that they, um, they already had a platform over here um, that um, uh, most of the Norwegian municipalities had access to. Uh, so in this platform, they had several APIs, which is the box at the bottom here um, with the ring. And they had solutions for other things um, that uh, the municipalities needed. And um, they had a user management tool and, and everything uh, that uh, would be needed for a, a municipality to start using and creating their uh, test team user, uh, their uh, tracker team user, for example. Um, so what COAS did was to put the DHS2 installation on this already existing platform and they would get user management and um, use uh, some sort of um, user buy-in from, from the very beginning. 
Um, it is uh, up to each individual municipality, as I mentioned, whether or not they want to use this tool. Uh, and um, uh, there was um, around half of the Norwegian municipalities uses this solution. Um, the first thing we had to do and build um, with, uh, with them was that um, this OpenID Connect support. And th there has been some uh, support for this before, but uh, when, they, um, when these contact tracers were going to log into the system, um, they would need to use a uh, third party provider, which is called the Health ID or Health ID. Um, and therefore, um, there was an OpenID Connect. Um, uh, well, the OpenID Connect uh, support was expanded to be better with the with the DHS2, and uh, this is now um, uh, the fruits of this labor can be harvested uh, in 236, and you can now use OpenID Connect in most uh, cases uh, because of the work that was done here back in in 234. Um, so the these contact tracers would log in uh, using their already existing health ID to the system. Uh, the next thing that was built uh, was the civil registry lookup and this was um, to make it faster to work in the system. Now, uh, Marcus, for some reason you've just uh, muted yourself. Oh, sorry. So the, there's a scary little button on my Jabra that uh, I seem to have touched, so thanks for letting me know. Um, so the civil registry lookup was the first thing that was built uh, after the very first uh, bare minimum of the index and contact tracing programs. Um, and this is a lookup that was done into the civil registry in, uh, in Norway to, um, to um, make it much faster to deliver uh, or register indexes and contacts. Um, we were playing with the idea of putting all the contacts and index, or all, all the population into the database up front, but uh, we weren't able to do, uh, do it like that. So this, um, this uh, index and contacts programs uh, are doing a, a lookup um, uh, based, on, um, uh, based on need while the registering. Um, and this is uh, what the tracker capture was first forked for to be able to do this uh, lookup with a button right inside tracker capture. Um, the next thing that was built was the vaccine lookup and uh, sorry, the LabDB lookup. The LabDB was, um, was uh, built as um, an API in, in the KS platform and um, the contact tracers uh, could make a lookup into the LabDB to find um, the lab results uh, directly in the tracker. Um, the next part that was built on uh, was the um, self-registration of um, contacts. Um, the contact tracers were using a lot of time um, calling indexes and asking about their contacts. And this was not easy to transfer over the phone. Um, there was spelling mistakes and it took a lot of time. So um, there, was, um, uh, there was built a, um, a citizen portal where uh, the citizen could log in with their, um, with their ID and uh, register their own uh, contacts. So an index would log in and register their contacts. And this, these contacts were pushed to the, um, to the contact program in DHS using the standard, uh, standard, standard APIs for, um, for um, adding tracked entity instances and events. Uh, we built a program for cluster management, which is um, sort of a grouping that these contact tracers could use to, to cluster indexes and contacts together. This was another program in the DHIS instance. Um, on the side, the, the Public Health Institute, FHI, in Norway had uh, built a notification a web application that um, required every index case to be registered in this uh, application as well. Uh, so even if the contact tracers had a digit digital system, they would have to enter data into the notification web portal. And um, uh, they were doing a lot of double entry um, for, this, uh, for these notifications. Uh, therefore, the, um, the data already entered in the index was uh, we, the, um, COAS built another API to be able to send the data directly from this um, index program and into the notification database at FHI. 
which was uh, tremendously well received at uh, contact tracers that, um, that were used to adding data twice. Um, another feature that was built by the uh, uh, Bureau of uh, the Central Bureau of Security in Norway uh, was the point of entry um, web application where uh, the um, uh, another kind of user, a uh, point of entry agent, would be able to log in and see all the uh, the people traveling into the country into their municipality. And these agents had a bit of a new job as well. This is not uh, something that has been done very often in Norway, and there was a lot of pension police officers and this kind of thing that would would now pick up the role of uh, following up the people that comes into the municipality and checking that they're doing their quarantine, for example, as they're supposed to. Uh, but they had their own web tool uh, on the very side of, um, well, uh, with their own login uh, at the central bureau. But um, uh, just uh, last week, COAS built a uh, API for uh, retrieving this data and also a tracker program to um, to work with the point of entry data. Uh, and now these uh, point of entry agents um, can use uh, DHS um, and uh, follow up uh, the point of entry uh, cases. Um, whereas the contact tracers will also see the, the point of entry uh, data when, when it's useful. Can, can point out at this stage that, of course, uh, this is one DHS instance that uh, contains all this data. And we, of course, made sure that there is only one tracked entry instance across contact index and point of entry. So in theory, one tracked entry instance might be enrolled into the contact program. He might become an index, uh, and then he would have an enrollment in both those programs. And if he at any point were entered, uh, ent entered the Norwegian uh, borders, uh, he would also be in the port of entry uh, program over here. Uh, so these contract tracers now have a pretty nice picture of the, um, of the persons and their movements. Um, the other contact tracing solutions um, also um, are using the architecture that is set up by, by COAS. Um, all these four boxes at the bottom here are APIs that is used by the DHIS2 system, but they are also used by the other contact tracing solutions, for example, for notifications, sending notifications, um, or um, uh, retrieving lab da that data, uh, or uh, in theory also receiving um, data from the civil registry. Uh, they would also uh, be able to connect to this API for point of entry. And uh, I think there is plans for at least some of them to connect to this um, this API that was built. Um, I also put vaccines at the bottom here, and uh, I added that right before the presentation, um, right before I started. So um, it shouldn't have shown up until now. I was going to mention that the vaccine data database is also being accessed through this uh, APIs, um, probably starting next week. So the contact tracers and agents can see vaccine data uh, through the the same uh, the same system. Um, I've already mentioned here at the end the, the self registration uh, that I talked about was um, a custom solution built by COAS and they were simply putting data in through the users API. Then um, there was also some work ongoing with the Norwegian uh, citizen health portal called Health Norge. Uh, and uh, they are um, they they were working on a, on a self registration form um, that didn't end up um, uh, being finished. Oops, uh, uh, but uh, still worth mentioning because we were working then on the fire standard um, to uh, well the Helsing Norge sending data on the fire standard. Uh, it wasn't a great uh, implementation of the fire standard, uh, to be honest. They were using the message uh, type and uh, more or less transferring the, um, the forms without really mapping them to the, the fire resources for, um, for health data. But, uh, but still, the, um, the, these messages was, uh, was following the, the message part of the fire uh, standard. Um, uh, Helge, if you're able to unmute, uh, you can uh, maybe comment if there is something I forgot or uh, that you want to expand on. No, if not, I will uh, just continue. Um, 
there was one crux that uh, was uh, apparent uh, I want to mention here at the very end um, that uh, that probably is going to be a problem for many uh, instances and I want to mention it because we are working on the solution on the software side uh, and there we came up with a workaround on the um, on the um, course fix project as well um, what of course happens when uh, when indexes are asked to self-register their contacts and these are read directly into the system is that there will be a lot of duplicates. And um, in a class, for example, if you send ask all the three indexes in that class to register their contacts, then um, you know that uh, most of the children in the class is going to be registered three times. Um, the same. Uh, problem can arise through the point of entry, where uh, the point of entry is a different system that is run on the border. Uh, and it's, they're sending the data into DHS. And at the point where this data is being pushed in through the DHS API here, the, um, uh, the data, might, the person, the track entry instance, might already be existing in the system. And the, the uh, point of entry would be pushing in a duplicate. So for this, um, there was a specific duplicate program that was built. And uh, this uh, API down here will make sure that, um, or this job that will uh, push the data into DHS will make sure that that the duplicate, um, uh, well, it will make a search into the system and see whether the person being inserted probably exists or not. And it will decide whether to create a new person or add the data to an existing one or whether to ask the user and create a possible duplicate in a different program. Um, and then these possible duplicates would have to be handled by the, by the contact tracers and port of entry agents uh, manually. Um, the same strategy workaround will be built in the self-registration uh, program, um, the self-registration portal, where these possible duplicates will end up in a duplicate program, and a contact tracer or point of agent um, point of entry agent would be um, uh, selecting whether they want to merge the duplicate or whether they want to create a new person from the possible duplicates. I want to mention this because we are working on duplication and deduplication now in the 2.37 release. And um, we're working on the services that will allow this um, to uh, happen more seamlessly in the DHS uh, system and does not have to be built as a separate job on the outside to check for these duplicates before inserting. Um, that is, however, my last uh, slide. So uh, thanks, everyone. And I will hand it over now to um, Mm, I don't remember. Is it Maurice next? Or no, it will be uh, Rajab from Tanzania. But uh, okay. thank you, Marcus. And, and again, just to point out, there's a link in the chats uh, where you can ask questions that, that would be preserved in our community of practice. We'll, we'll answer questions not only during the session, but we can continue afterwards. Um, and, and just one, one thing to mention about the, the Norwegian experience. We, we often are asked as we're entering a new country about is DHS2 used in Norway? Um, we're very glad to be able to say, yes, it is. And we're also very glad to report that it's just as challenging to, to do health information system architecture properly in Norway as it is anywhere else. Hopefully you, you got the sense from Marcus's diagram there that uh, this is not some beautiful, elegant, easy to implement solution in Norway any more than it would be anywhere else. These are complicated issues connecting to all the correct systems and having a, a you know a sensible a sensible workflow is challenging so it was uh, i think good for us to to be closely involved in this implementation here it's been helpful to learn from that as well and again the uh, the, the duplicates issue that marcus mentions is something that will help us to push forward uh, in the, the coming releases anyway thank you marcus so I think uh, Rajab from uh, Tanzania, we're, we're going to ask you to be sharing your screen and presenting next. Um, hello, I'm Rajab. I think you can see me from his Tanzania. I'm one of system developer, also involved in uh, tracker implementation, specifically on COVID uh, monitoring, supporting the Minister of Health of Tanzania. So I will be sharing my, my screen. Um, I hope you can see my screen. I, I, I think you are, you are seeing the, 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 the Zoom. So uh, right away to my presentation, um, 
uh, you can see my screen, I hope. Yes, we can see your slides now. Yes, yes, yeah. No. Uh, so basically, I want to talk a little bit on digital um, uh, health interoperability, but uh, my use case is more focusing on the work that had, has been done or is actually being being done in Tanzania on capping on solving some of the COVID uh, implementations. So basically, uh, from our side, uh, uh, I can give a little bit of a background uh, since when the COVID broke out in March, uh, where or when our country, uh, as much uh, the same as other country, actually uh, voted to so, sort of follow the uh, uh, WHO uh, travel restrictions. And at that point, the travel bans, international borders were closed. But soon after, our late president uh, sort of opened uh, the borders and uh, more like uh, allowed some of the travelers to come in or out of our country. So at that time, uh, it was really necessary for the country to more like ensure that despite the movement of people, uh, the country actually uh, controls the outbreak. Through that, uh, so uh, the government implemented uh, a sort of mechanism to make sure all travelers are being tested and are given certificates so that when they are going out or coming in in the country, they can be verified. At that point, um, uh, by then, the, the the testing or the sample that uh, travelers ha ha has to be tested, they are being collected at one place, which is National uh, Public wow. Health Laboratory, uh, co uh, located in one of the major cities in Tanzania. So uh, at that point, there were a little bit of more challenges, uh, including uh, long, long queues, uh, travelers were waiting at the national uh, lab to more like take samples to more like being tested also they actually have to uh, go back and, and get back again to the national lab to collect their certificate when they are ready so it's, it's, it was a little bit of um, a challenge when it comes to more like ensuring that uh, travelers are given a right certificate but also that actually uh, brought about uh, a, 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 an emergency or a problem of a forged certificate so in a way there was no a little bit of uh, clear or best way to verify you know the certificate of whether this person is negative or not so that was another problem and again uh, as you know the in our country or in this african country these testings are to be paid for in order to more like paid pay for those instruments that are used for testing and etc so uh, uh, as well also payment was a little bit of a challenge for that uh, travelers has had has, has to stay uh, to, to use a lot a lot of time in the national lab actually paying for uh, testing fees uh, all together with taking some point uh, co co collecting certificates so uh, through that um his tanzania in collaboration with Min uh, university of dar es salaam also as because we are supporting the minister of health collaboratively we thought of uh, no more like uh, coming up of uh, why to more like ensuring or simplify this process or more like minimizing the challenges that ha had 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 been uh, seen through this uh, COVID testing operation. So this is sort of what we came up about uh, with the ministry and the idea was uh, we have to find a way for uh, more like to minimize the movement of travelers. So travelers were, were actually have to book for COVID-19 testing. And because the testing are being, being paid for, we had to find a, a way or a solution of how best we can actually perform payment and then how best we can collect. So as I said earlier, the collection of um, samples were done at one place, but now, now because travelers may actually come from different areas uh, across the country, so that we, we sort of uh, try to find a solution where uh, these uh, samples can be collected and the uh, information uh, about the sample can be transferred into that central center, which is National Lab. And of course, the sample themselves can be transported there. Also, uh, now, again, as in the floor, we, we sort of uh, try to find a way where the testing can be done and resulting being documented uh, within the system. And also the certification process now can come about where the validity certificate can be issued 
to travel uh, so that to cap that issue of forged the certificate. Uh, but also as much as the certificate are out, uh, we also had to find a way of more like for uh, immigration officers or port of entry officers to more like verify those uh, provided certificates. So in this way, what we came about is sort of uh, a, a, a system uh, that is uh, more like developed under the national HIS uh, platform, which is based on DHS2, uh, which we call Pima COVID uh, applications. So the application more like uh, is co covering uh, the workflow or the flow of when the traveler wants to book for a testing. So a person would actually have to go to a public portal uh, using either tablet, a PC, or a, a mobile application and actually book for a COVID test. So essentially, we were able to, for, to, to make sure that travelers from across the, the country uh, at least can book uh, for a COVID test anywhere or at any point they, they are. And then more like for the booked dates, they can actually go to the uh, facility for testing. But before that, they had to do a little bit of uh, payment. As I said earlier, these tests the test are supposed to be paid. So in that, we also actually had to figure out a way of, of co connecting uh, these payment processes uh, with other payment uh, systems around the country so as to seamlessly uh, simplify the process of, of payment. So essentially, as in the floor, we'll talk a little bit uh, more on the payment later. In the floor, a person has to actually book for a COVID-19 test and then will be sent a message, either SMS or email. Uh, uh, then from the email, uh, it will bear information for details to, to, for, for payment. So if I, I travel, I'll actually, actually go to, to pay for, for the test. And then when the payment uh, confirmation comes in, the uh, traveler will actually go to the testing site uh, where the samples will be collected. As I said now, uh, since simply because we have introduced the system, now the testing site uh, were a little bit extended to 64 as opposed to what before was just one testing site that was National Laboratory. So travelers actually goes to those testing sites and take samples. And of course, those samples will be, will be transported to National Laboratory for testing. Uh, the reason is that uh, the government of Tanzania wants to centralize all the testing, testing for COVID-19 in one place so that the information that is given out is actually reliable and the government is sure of the results. So essentially, after the, the traveler has been tested, uh, in many cases, uh, the traveler would actually have to wait for test results to be ready. To be ready. And essentially, uh, a traveler will be sent with another more like email notification uh, bearing uh, the link to uh, traveler certificate provided the traveler is negative. So a, a traveler can actually receive an email or SMS in that manner and on the on the SMS, he or she will actually uh, download the certificate, which uh, the certificate will be shown at the POE uh, or at the immigration officer or, or officers when the uh, traveler is actually going out of the country. So essentially, uh, this whole process also uh, covers the part where the samples are collected. Uh, so the lab managers are able to more like uh, register uh, the sample details for a, a traveler into the system, which then when the results comes, uh, comes out, the lab managers also can more like uh, register the, the results. And once the results are registered, automatically the email or the notification will be sent to travelers. Of course, for travelers that are a little bit, uh, or that are not negative in a way, probably they are positive or there may be something in their tests, Usually they are sent with also messages uh, telling them to more like repeat the testing uh, some other time so that to confirm whether they are really positive or or there is something wrong with their testing. So a major uh, or oh, a major strength of uh, this workflow was that now because we are looking of uh, best way to cover the payment scheme, as I I highlighted earlier. Uh, there are many ways in our country uh, for, for payments. So there is mobile payments, there is bank payments, etc. So we actually have to figure out a way to 
more like connect with uh, other payment system around. Fortunately, our country uh, has uh, what we call government electronic payment gateway, uh, which is GPG, where, where the, the system actually offers to integrate with any other system to smoothly uh, tackle on the problems for payment. So this is how it works. It's actually the, our system is sending a, a sort of a request to acquire sort of invoices, or we, we call them bill, to the GPG. GPG automatically sends the, 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 the bill information to our system. We send the bill information to a traveler. A traveler goes to a financial institution, whether, as I said, mobile payment or bank or online and pay. And automatically the bank already connected with this GPG system actually responds to GPG system. And then also GPG system responds back to, to our system. And then we, and there we know exactly this person has paid. So this has simplified a lot as when the uh, traveler, traveler goes to a sample collection, it's quite easier for a sample collector to know that this person is already, or has already paid for, for a test and the sample are being collected and the rest are actually going forward. Uh, now, this probably may be some of, uh, of uh, notifications. I, I just wanted to give you a, a two minute warning, just uh, on timing, but yeah. Oh, okay, all right, <laughs> yeah, sure. So basically, these are a quick of a uh, few not notifications uh, that uh, basically um, are, are given out uh, for, for, for payment for payment confirmation or also for validity certificate. Because of time, I think this is my last, last uh, slide. Basically, as I said earlier, this uh, overall um, PIMA COVID is built upon oh, centrally uh, using DHS2. So actually, we, what we have done, we have a little bit of some other modules like public uh, portal where travelers will actually have to book for for COVID, for COVID uh, tests also, they, that is where also they can print or they can view their certificates. But in the middle, we sort of actually have so, sort of adapter, we call them mediator, where the, the uh, uh, public portal actually connects to DHS to sending information as uh, creating, in this case, track identity instance, which we call booking. And then also we have a sort of a GEPG adapter uh, which actually communicates with that payment gateway system and also the adapter also uh, update the DHS2 system actually in, in ensuring that uh, payments are made. Also the DHS2, uh, within the DHS2 system, we had to actually construct uh, 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 custom applications where booking managers, uh, lab managers can more like interact in actually entering uh, the, the results, etc. Also, just to finalize a little bit, uh, there is also part of accountants. As we said, this, this system is linked with uh, payment systems. So accountants actually have to, in any way, in, in any case, verify some bit of payment information within the system. So there's a sort of a payment reconciliation, whereby for the details that we have received from GPG and the details that accountants have for banking, they can more like compare automatically within the system and actually bring about some of the reports, which actually to them uh, makes sense in terms of verifying the payments. So basically, as I said earlier, uh, this uh, system has helped help a lot the government to more like uh, realize a little bit of many aspects. For example, we have largely reduced the uh, turnaround time for COVID-19 testing at least to 40, 24 hours before it was more, more than, than 72. But also that helps also a government to decentralize the sample collection centers, as I said earlier, because we have a system now. Uh, also, as uh, what is a major strength now, uh, the uh, more like the government actually has seen uh, or have a confidence of now through this innovation to be able to more like coming up with more use cases. For example, there is this implementation that is coming uh, along now, which is called the Afium Safiri which is actually focusing on actually those passengers that are the female COVID was based on those which uh, who wants to go out there of the country. So based on this, uh, the government has the confidence that they can actually coming up of the Afium Safiri platform also uh, around DHS2 with all these uh, interconnection um, across the payment gateway other system in that case. 
I think uh, because of time, probably uh, this is uh, my last, last slide. Thank you for listening. Uh, also, Asante Sana. I actually may uh, have to transfer my screen to, I think is uh, the, from Rwanda. Yes, Maurice, Maurice, I think, can take over. But Asante Sana, <laughs> thank you, uh, Rajab. That was, that was great. There, there's at least one question for you in the chat if you feel like typing a response there. And uh, I think that was a great example of uh, what I was talking about, about considering kind of all of the different actors and what their information is. Or so it's a really strong example for Tanzania. Thank you. So, Maurice, I, I think we're ready for you now uh, from Rwanda if you're able to share your screen. Oh, all right, let me let me try to share my screen. Are you able to view my screen now? Yes. Oh, all right. Oh, thank you. Um, oh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Maurice Ju Malisa. I'm a software developer at His and I'm very interested and uh, uh, happy to to present in this session about innovative uh, architecture to support COVID-19 response. At HISPI Rwanda, we have uh, enabled the DHIS2 information exchange with other health information systems. And um, throughout this uh, period uh, of COVID-19, we have had uh, great uh, uh, experiences and we're about to share with you all about this. We did all this with the aim to facilitate um, and promote the data quality and data use uh, to provide timely evidence-based decisions. We also aimed at improving uh, the availability of data and utilization of data in healthcare sector. Um, you will see in uh, the, the following slides that we have used different materials, including uh, laptops and tablets, which uh, had all DHIS2 installed in them. These are the systems that I will be focusing on. And on the upper part, you will see different apps that Hispiranda has created that also um, use DHIS2 API. And on the lower part, you will see the APIs. Sometimes we were um, we made the challenges where we are supposed to build a custom API to help other institutions uh, access DHIS2 data. Um, for example, you will see the passenger allocator form. Uh, you will see self-registration form, which actually works uh, somehow like the Norway version of it. Uh, you will see online portal and uh, different mobile applications that has helped very much the public to, to, to manage this COVID pandemic. Um, before I deep dive into the systems, we also have a, uh, a look of the summarized uh, system flow of, the, of our instance. We have a DHS2 um, patient registration and clinical diagnostic where we do manual data entry or also people can actually register without leaving their homes using online registration. Upon registration, people receive their SMS and emails uh, telling them about the unique IDs that they will be using every time they need any, any services regarding COVID-19. Uh, sample is received at the lab, they test it, and after the results are available, someone receives another SMS telling them about the result status and also inviting them or encouraging them to check the results online and generate their certificate. Uh, on the current status, we have a countrywide system implementation, both Android and, and uh, web version. Over 2,000 active uh, users countrywide and over 500 uh, tablets and 200 smartphones in use right now. Uh, we have both web and Android and system updates uh, provided and continued support to the users uh, throughout the country. Great. Uh, talking about the different systems, I will begin with self-registration, which actually will show you the, the journey of someone from registration to getting their COVID certificate. 
Um, this idea came when there were long queues on the testing sites where like uh, uh, thousands of people were queued to the testing sites just to be entered into the system. Then the system uh, has been, it's an online portal where people can come. I think someone can help me admit people because Yes, don't worry. Uh, we're, we're letting them in. All right, thank you. And um, the, during this process, this, um, someone can enter the personal information, demographic information, and the payment option. Actually, now people don't have to carry cash to the sites where they're going to be tested. They have also an option to choose their payment option and pay online without leaving their houses. And um, we're going to see how the system works. There's a, there's, a part, there's a part where someone can enter their national ID. Then with the national ID, we can contact the national identification agency, get someone's information without uh, manual, uh, entering, manual entering data. Then someone can also input their demographic and the location and the person is taken to the payment page. On, upon the payment page, you can choose um, either to pay uh, by the card. Also, we understand that not everyone has a Visa or MasterCard uh, option or um, mobile money. Some people actually will struggle and they will prefer to pay by cash. This is a still an option, but people here in Rwanda, they love online payments and this system has helped them a lot to, to, to fast forward this process. Uh, we had challenges implementing this system where people would um, have wrong information. Uh, we, when we compare to the DHS2 tracker and the, the information they gave us, sometimes it's not correct. And some people don't have access to smartphones and sometimes high traffic would cause DHS2 or DPO, DPO which was our online payments service provider. Their APIs sometimes would fail, which it was not often, but Whenever they fail, we receive a few calls about uh, the people not being able to register. There is a um, Ari, just, to the just, just a time warning. I, I would love to, to listen to you forever, but I know there's another session after this. We have about two minutes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, oh, right. Thank you. Sure. Um, I'm going to talk more about the, the online portal. The online portal, basically, what it does, it helps people to come and uh, check their results online. Then. When the results are available, they can generate certificate and also present the certificate anywhere. And um, this is the interfaces you can see. This is the view of, uh, it can be a tablet or a phone. You see your uh, test profile and uh, different results you, that you've taken. And also you can generate certificate to present anywhere, airport or any venue. Uh, more to that, we have also, uh, with main challenges that actually are the same as the previous ones. And to fast forward, um, I'd like to talk about um, the certificate app scanner, which also is used at the, at the airport and sometimes at any venues where people can come and present their certificate. Our QR code is encrypted, which is the reason why we have made a custom QR scanner app to be used at those venues. Uh, there is a passenger locator form, which is used by, it's like a self-registration, but for the people coming to the country. It has uh, also online payment or payment at the arrival. The challenges we had was that uh, you cannot, you could not validate someone's profile until they arrive at the airport. So that was the challenge. And we worked so hard to mitigate this challenge by um, uh, helping the people. Uh, by actually uh, checking someone's information, whether they have registered before in DHIS2 or not. I think the, the last point we had a hotel's dashboard. This was a challenge because people who come into the hotels forget to take their results and actually stay more days in the hotels. Now the hotels can actually view whether someone's results are available, then go in their rooms, tell them to check and generate their certificate to leave the hotel. Um, 
We had also in regional electronic cargo and driver tracking systems where if someone is coming from Kenya, they don't have to register again. We, have, we can um, uh, process their test, then uh, update the system across the region. Uh, last point, which, uh, which was actually uh, interesting, uh, we didn't know this could work, it was uh, helping the DHIS to inter interoperability between uh, sporting events. We've had a uh, throw basket last year and we had the basketball African League uh, this year. And we, we helped their system also um, checking the, the fans or the spectators, allowing them to enter the stadiums. It was, uh, it was difficult to, to know how and when someone has taken the, the, the certificate. I'll be happy to answer. I think the time is on, not on my side, but uh, this, is, this was an interesting um, topic and I will be happy to answer how we carried out this, uh, helping the uh, NBA and their teams to help them uh, get the people in their stadiums. And it was really a successful implementation. Uh, this is the next steps where we want to uh, develop uh, an, an RBC, Random Biometric Process Center application, which is going to have all the systems, uh, including starting with uh, COVID related systems. And we have finished making a universal API where other institutions can connect to DHIS2 uh, through that API. And um, all this, um, uh, this one has been developed already. And the last one is under development and is 70% done. Uh, these are the systems and solution we have done uh, during this period. And we thank you for your support, the DHIS2 core team and the other DHIS2 implementers. And we, we couldn't wait to present to you what we have done so far. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you so much, Maurice. And we'll, we'll have to end the session there. The links are there in the chat if you want to ask any additional questions. I think these three have been really great examples of kind of how complex uh, these integrations can be and the, the types of uh, tools that can be used to connect various different systems. I think they're just three of many uh, of the countries using DHS2 for COVID that could have presented here. There's been a lot of great innovation and really interesting approaches to this over the last year and a half. So I, I really thank our presenters for and those of you that attended. Again, if you have more questions, please put them in the community of practice. We're happy to follow up. And with that, I think we have to end so the next session can start. So thank you so much, everyone.